As you know, Father Richard has themed this series of talks, Aspects of Aquinas' Anthropology. And I'd like to begin by saying a few words on the importance of this broader topic. In his great biography of Thomas Aquinas, Jean-Pierre Torel notes that questions regarding the human soul seem to occupy much of Thomas' interest in the later years of his life. Among other works, we might note the questions on man in Summa Theologiae Part 1, the disputed questions on spiritual creatures, the disputed questions on the human soul, the treatise on the unity of the intellect, the commentary on Aristotle's De Anima, the commentary on the Book of Causes, and the Summa Theologiae Part 3, in which the extensive analysis of the Incarnation involves further soundings into the extraordinary being that is man an integral unity of spirit and matter. Indeed, Thomas points out that the human-soul-body union is the closest analog we have to the unity of nature's in the incarnate word. <clears throat> Doubtless, Thomas delved into the structure of human nature in order to know better the person of Jesus Christ and the structures of the sacramental and spiritual life. But it's also true that Thomas's metaphysical anthropology is, in its own right, one of his monumental legacies. As Anton Pagus showed in the middle of the 20th century, Thomas's account of man is a striking example of how its author is a great synthesizer of previous thinkers because his insight has moved to a higher plane. In the case of the human being, Thomas is faced with the platonic insistence on man's spirituality, the soul's supernatural origins, and its longing for the eternal and divine. Not surprisingly, for the first thousand years of its life, Christian revelation saw some form of Platonism as uniquely accommodated to its own fullness of truth. But Thomas is also faced with Aristotle's more incarnational vision, which sees the forms of Plato as existent right here by way of their proper matter. For Aristotle, the soul and body unite to form one substance, a living organism, characterized in the highest case by thought and will. Uniting the Platonic and Aristotelian insights, Thomas argues that our souls are indeed spiritual realities. At the same time, the human soul is unique among spiritual realities in that it achieves thought and choice only in and through the physical realm. The human soul, by its very essence, communicates its own spiritual being to matter and is thus the form of the body. So the human soul is not a spirit that is descended into matter. Rather, it is the kind of spirit, the only kind, that can be fully itself only in and through its integral union with a body. The lowest sort of spirit is that which is joined with the highest sort of matter, and this is the human being. Our way of being spiritual always involves physicality, and our way of being physical is sourced and characterized by spirituality. This analysis is a philosophical triumph, since it both explains coherently what we are, but also opens up the mystery of the human all the more. We wonder what it means for matter to exist through a spiritual act of being, or for a spiritual reality to exercise itself through bodiliness. Scientific inquiry acquires a new significance since it reveals something about the strangest sort of matter in the world, physical organs and processes that possess spiritual existence. In turn, theology and the humanities benefit from viewing rational, communal, and spiritual life as integrally shaped within the bodily historical context. Aquinas' anthropology has important ramifications, too, on the significance of music and art in human life, given the incarnational structure of these activities. As the ancients perceived, the human being is the microcosm of creation, and the metaphysical structure of such a creature is nowhere on clearer display than in the thought of Aquinas. At a time when the very notion of human nature is questioned, when its goodness is doubted, its reproduction thwarted, and its transition into some other life form pursued, we should avail ourselves more than ever of the insights that Thomas has left us. So let me turn to gender, and specifically to an examination of it within the context of Thomas's metaphysical anthropology. And let me note at the outset that my use of the term gender is meant to refer to the biological structures and capacities in virtue of which persons have traditionally been called male or female. So I'm not using gender here in the kind of postmodern sense that would, would oppose it and exclude it from biological sex. Could I have used the word sex instead? Yes, but that has ambiguities of its own. 
Since gender-related questions are such provocative issues right now, let me be clear as to what this lecture is not doing. First, I am not describing the various sorts of traits, psychological or behavioral, that differentiate men and women. Certainly such differentiating characteristics exist, or else we wouldn't be here. But aside from the obvious biological ones, it's difficult to articulate with certainty what constitutes a masculine or a feminine trait. Most of us live and talk as though men and women have distinct behavioral traits, but our knowledge of these is rather intuitive and implicit, which is not to say that such knowledge is weak or fanciful. Philosophical inquiry into what man and woman are, such as I propose to undertake, could help explain why behavioral traits are so elusive, so difficult to articulate. It could also suggest a basis for determining what might count as a masculine trait or a feminine one, and why. On the biological side, scientific discoveries greatly contribute to our understanding of male and female differences, but even these need constant positioning within a properly philosophical background, lest their meaning be lost to us. The second thing this lecture is not doing is directly addressing the controversial gender issues dominating today's headlines, homosexuality, pansexuality, transgender, cisgender, reproductive technologies, three-parent children, and so on. My inquiry is partly motivated by these phenomena, but at heart I'm trying to do something proactive, not reactive. Besides, any response to the overthrow of traditional gender identities and activities won't get far without an understanding of what man and woman are, fundamentally. Third and finally, owing to time constraints, I will consider neither the psychological, social, nor ethical dimensions of being man or woman, all very important aspects, but too vast for one talk. My goal, then, is to look at man and woman from the standpoint of first philosophy, or metaphysics. Notably, the human being, as male and female, has received little attention in the history of Western philosophy, especially in comparison to the history of Western art and literature. We could speculate on several interesting reasons for why this might be, but for now, suffice it to say that the Thomist tradition has been no exception. So although my immediate reason for pursuing this topic is to see how Thomas's thought sheds light on maleness and femaleness, I hope thereby to come to a deeper truth about humanness, to follow the Delphic injunction to know thyself. The following analysis will proceed by way of a dialogue with Thomas Aquinas. I'll employ reflection on pre-philosophic experience and the findings of modern biology in unison with Thomas's teachings on human nature. My main thesis is that being male or female properly characterizes the whole person and ultimately stems from the soul. Although this claim partly contradicts Thomas's explicit teaching, I intend to show that it aligns better with his own principles. The argument will unfold in four sections. In section one, I'll outline Thomas's position. <coughs> in section two, I'll give a brief evaluation, including some correctives from biology. Section three will propose a revised account of gender focusing on in articulating it in terms of soul and body. And in section four, I will describe a few ramifications of the argument, noting gender's place in the person, in the shared human essence, and in the specifically human experience. The essay concludes by briefly addressing two contemporary concerns, sex reassignment surgery and the intersex condition. So section one, Thomas's account of gender. Let's begin with what we know best, a man is a male human being and a woman a female human being. Following Aristotle, Thomas defines the male as that which can generate in another, while the female is that which can generate in itself. These definitions apply throughout the animal kingdom, and like all good definitions, are simple but true, implicitly revealing profound realities. Whatever human and even theological meanings man and woman have, they are somehow integrally connected with these respective abilities to generate in another and in oneself. Our question then is what kind of reality is maleness or femaleness within the human substance? What is the connection between being male and female on the one hand and being human on the other? In one sense, gender is accidental to a person's being human in the first place, <coughs> since men and women share human nature equally. One's gender neither compromises nor elevates one's degree of humanity. But perhaps gender is not accidental with respect to how one participates in human nature. It might be better to say that men and women share human nature equally but differently, 
according to their respective generative abilities. In an analogous way, being blue-eyed or brown-eyed pertain equally but differently to the human power of vision. Being choleric or melancholic pertain equally but differently to the human possession of temperament. Still, gender is a more significant personal attribute than eye color or temperament, since it involves distinct organs, activities, and purposes. As well, gender constitutes a fairly even and consistent cut across the human species, whereas color, temperament, bone structure, and other such attributes characterize the species erratically and asymmetrically. Let's consider Thomas's approach to this issue by examining two of his classifications of accident. And here, accident simply means some feature or attribute that a substance possesses and that depends on a substance for its being. The first classification is in the disputed questions on the soul. Here, Thomas articulates gender within the context of logical categories, genus, species, difference, property, and accident. The second classification of accidents is in on being and essence, which considers accidents with regard to their origin in form or in matter, resulting in a more metaphysical description of gender. The logical classification in the disputed question speaks of three sorts of accident. The first is the proper accident, for example, risibility in humans, the ability to laugh. Proper accidents, such as this, result from the principles of the species and thus characterize all of its members. Thomas elsewhere refers to these accidents simply as properties. The second sort of accident is the inseparable accident, and here Thomas's examples are masculine and feminine. Inseparable accidents result from the principles of the individual through permanent causation. That is, they characterize not the whole species, but particular human beings, and they do so in lasting fashion. Separable accidents, the third sort, are accidents such as sitting and walking. These flow from the principles of the individual, but through temporary causation. Thus, they only accrue to particular human beings at particular times. Our concern here is with the second type, the inseparable accident, since Thomas locates gender here. He does not limit the category of inseparable accident to gender, as he mentions other accidents of this sort, yet he does not specify what these others are. On the one hand, the text seems to allow the features like eye color and skin color, bone structure, vocal quality, and native temperament could all be considered inseparable accidents since they fit the criterion of resulting from the principles of the individual through permanent causation. On the other hand, the other examples in Thomas's writings of inseparable accident don't pertain to humans, and so they're not particularly helpful in helping us determine whether gender is in fact the only inseparable accident. Suffice it to say that gender is distinct from accidents like eye color or skin color owing to the presence of particular organs, activities, and teleologies to characterize one gender or the other. So if inseparable accidents result from the principles of the individual, which principle or principles in the individual originate gender? Is it soul or body? Or somehow both? Thomas addresses this question in On Being and Essence, the second classification, the more metaphysical one. He begins by noting that the whole substance, the whole person, is the true subject of all accidents. Still, because substances like humans are composed of matter and form as principles, certain accidents follow more from form, while others follow more from matter. Thomas describes four sorts of accidents, two following from form primarily, and two following from matter primarily. <clears throat> First, among those following from form, we have rational activities. Understanding and willing occur entirely within the spiritual powers of the soul, and consequently have no share in matter. Though, to be sure, such actions depend on the dispository activity of physical sense organs. Second, other accidents following from form, like sensation, do have a share in matter, since they properly reside in the composite substance. The soul, that is, originates the powers of sensation, but it can't sense on its own. Moving downward, accidents following from matter will always have some relation to form, since matter on its own is pure potency, uncharacterized by any feature. So, third, among accidents following from matter, some relate to a particular kind of form. Thus, masculine and feminine, says Thomas, are accidents that follow from matter, but precisely in relation to an animal form. A sign of this connection is that once the animal form, or soul, has departed, 
Gender, properly speaking, no longer remains, just as an eye of a corpse is called an eye only equivocally. Fourth and finally, other accidents following from matter relate to a more general form, as one's skin color occurs through matter's relation to the form of some elemental mixture. The color thus remains even after the person has died. In distinguishing these third and fourth sorts of accident, Thomas acknowledges the difference noted earlier between gender and non-teleological accidents like eye color or skin color, which might be considered inseparable accidents. So combining these two classifications, Thomas's account holds that gender is an inseparable accident following from matter, but in direct relation to the substantial form of an animal. Gender is the only example given of such an accident, which suggests that it's a metaphysically unique sort of feature. Now, if being male or female relates necessarily to the form of an animal, why does Thomas assign gender's origin to matter? He gives two reasons. One is grounded in the difference in activity of the two genders, the other is grounded in their shared essence or species. With regard to the first, Thomas follows Aristotle in holding that because the male and female are respectively active and passive principles in generation, the male is therefore a truer generating agent than is the female. The male semen contains the active formal causality necessary for reproduction, while the woman supplies material causality through her seminal fluid. Since any agent seeks to produce its likeness as far as possible, any given act of generation naturally tends toward a male offspring for Aristotle and Thomas. <clears throat> what explains the coming to be of a female is an accidental alteration in the male semen. Depending on the way in which the seminal matter has been affected, therefore, a male or female will result, which indicates that gender originates from matter rather than from form. Thomas does not deny that the human reproductive power flows from the soul, as do all powers. Rather, he claims that this power is more perfectly actualized in a man and less perfectly actualized in a woman, owing to a defect in her matter. The second reason for maintaining that gender follows from matter also comes from Aristotle. In Thomas's commentary on Aristotle's metaphysics, he explains that because form makes the matter to be of a certain kind or species, a difference in form must entail a difference in species. So a dog and a cat, for example, are different species primarily because they have different forms. So differences proper to individuals of the same species must be differences originating from matter rather than from form. Human men and women clearly share a species which means that their differences could not originate from their form as the intelligible structure of human is present in both of them. So instead, relying on the first line of reasoning just given, Aristotle and Thomas are able to hold that gender, while proper to animal, originates from the side of matter, from the semen insofar as it is or is not affected in a certain way. I think it's worth pointing out that Thomas does not simply deduce that gender must originate from matter since individual differences can't originate from form. Because gender stands out metaphysically among other accidents, like color, Thomas withholds from applying to it the same sort of deductive reasoning as he does the others. Instead, he invokes facts apparently observed in the biological and psychological realms, facts connected with the notion that the male is active and the female passive. Thomas's principles could allow one to deduce simply that gender must stem from matter, since individual differences don't stem from form, but Thomas doesn't take that route. While the ultimate conclusion is the same for all individual accidents, that they come from matter, not from form, Thomas employs additional reasoning in the case of gender, and he qualifies his conclusion through the reminder that gender relates in an important way to the form at hand. A sign of this relation is that animal is presupposed in the definitions of male and female while it need never be mentioned in the definitions of black and white. Before concluding this exposition of Thomas's account, let me mention that gender's origin from matter does not mean that it has no metaphysical bearing on the soul. In a number of places, Thomas refers to the commensuration or essential relation that each human soul has to its body. Once a soul of this body, he maintains, always a soul of this body, which allows for souls to be distinguished from each other even after death. While the soul on its own, or in its own right, is not gendered, 
just as the soul on its own possesses no sensation, presumably the soul of a human male can be derivatively considered a male soul, and the same in the case of the female, since the soul's identity is marked by its being the soul of the male or female body. <coughs> One's gender, then, as following from the principles of the individual, characterizes the person as a whole. So section two, a brief evaluation of Thomas's account. Thomas's logical classification of gender as an inseparable accident makes sense. Being male or female occurs not to the species at large, but to individual members of it. Moreover, current biology's understanding of genetic systems, chromosomal patterns, gonadal structures, and sexual organs affirms that the principles of the individual exercise permanent causation in their originating one gender or another. All the same, that gender seems to be in a class by itself, even among inseparable accidents, calls for further inquiry. Such inquiry calls for engagement with Thomas's metaphysical articulation of gender, namely that it's an accident following primarily from a substance's matter in relation to a particular sort of form. Thomas rightly holds that being male or female cannot stem from form as essence or intelligible structure of the human species, which is common to all humans. Thus, if the claim that gender follows from matter simply means that it originates from the individual and not from the principles common to all humans, Thomas's reasoning would be indisputable. <clears throat> Notably, such reasoning would still leave open the question as to which of the individual substance's principles originates gender, soul or matter or both. Yet Thomas appears to answer this question too in claiming that alterations in the semen account for one gender or the other. That is, he holds not just that gender stems from the principles of the individual, but also that being male or female stems concretely from the side of one's matter, rather than from one's substantial form or soul. Now, current biology, of course, has shown that the female reproductive abilities are not imperfect versions of the male ones. Man and woman, respectively, do not supply the active formal principle of generation and the passive material principle of generation that a man's production of semen and a woman's ovulation each supply distinct elements of the offspring's genetic material reveals that in this capacity, the two are co-contributors to the offspring. Since man and woman do not relate generatively as perfect to imperfect, it is not the case that any given act of generation seeks the male. As contemporary science shows, male and female are equally intended at the biological level. So Thomas's empirical reason for assigning gender's origin to matter the first reason mentioned earlier, is no longer tenable. The remaining question is whether his second reason holds, whether one should deduce that gender follows principally from one's matter and not from one's form, since an individual difference cannot follow from form. So let's move into section three, a revised account, gender as regards soul and body. Here I will argue within the context of Thomistic principles that being male or female follows more from substantial form than from matter, more from the soul than the body. And in developing the argument, I will respond to three objections. Evidently, man and woman in their normal, mature states possess distinct organs for particular purposes. As Aristotle and Thomas argue, male and female differ from black and white by containing the substance's essence within their definitions. This is because gender involves a particular function and telos in the substance, while other accidents like black, white, or blue-eyed entail no distinct organs and serve no apparent purpose. The presence of an organ indicates a particular configuration of matter for the sake of one of the soul's powers, which in turn flows from the essence of the soul. The soul itself arranges material structures as organs so that they might fittingly serve as means through which the soul's various powers can operate effectively. Thomas puts it succinctly in the disputed questions on the soul. Quote, the soul constitutes diverse parts in the body, even as it fits them for diverse operations. End quote. Gender, as its organs manifest, occurs foundationally at the level of the soul's vegetative powers. These, like the powers of sensation, flow from the soul's essence, but find their existence and activity within particular bodily organs that the soul as form actualizes and shapes over time. As with the sensory powers, were the soul to leave the body, the generative powers would no longer remain, strictly speaking. Yet unlike the sensory powers, the generative powers never exist and act in a way that all humans share. 
Instead, roughly half of all humans possess the generative powers and organs that we call male, and the other half, those we call female. The generative powers of man and woman should be considered, strictly speaking, co-generative, since they possess a two-fold formal object distinguished hierarchically. As generative, they possess the same ultimate object, namely procreation of another human being. While as co, their proximate objects differ by way of involving distinct sexual organs and activities, yet in relation with each other. The ultimate object of the cogenerative powers points to the unity of nature shared by man and woman, since another of the same species, whether male or female, is generated. The proximate object of the cogenerative powers points to the distinction within human nature as found in either man or woman, albeit only at the level of the reproductive capacities. Given distinct proximate objects and activities of the gendered organs, pointing in turn to distinct powers as cogenerative in each case, the anatomical structures and living activities of man and woman indicate that one's gender follows from one's soul, or substantial form, since matter is not the kind of principle that can arrange itself in a determinate structure for a particular purpose. Put simply, distinct proximate objects, activities, and organs point to distinct cogenerative powers, which point to distinction originating from substantial form. Now, to be sure, gender intrinsically concerns matter, for like sensation, it involves physical life in its meaning and actuality. Any argument that would reify the soul as distinct from the body will fail, for as Thomas strongly argues and experience attests, man is not a soul clothed in a body. Integral to the soul's essence is that it be the act of a body, and integral to this soul's essence is that it be the act of this body. Hence, gender is not a characteristic in or of the soul, as though the soul could be considered a substance in its own right with this particular accident. Instead, like sensation, gender is a characteristic of the composite substance, the whole person, but stemming from the soul. My position concerning gender is not meant to emphasize the distinction between form and matter, but to indicate how intimately the body's organization and development flow from the soul. Hence, we can provisionally locate gender with sensation in the category of accidents that stem from form and have a share in matter, so the second group described in On Being in Essence. Further development of this account of gender can best occur by engaging three important objections. So, objection one. The first objection is that gender and its entire physical development is crucially connected to particular genetic networks and especially to the YX or XX chromosome pattern found in the zygote. In this light, one could argue that modern biology reintroduces an empirical reason for supporting Thomas's view that connects gender differentiation with matter primarily. In one sense, I fully agree. Yet I would argue that this connection confirms not that gender stems from matter primarily, but that matter and form are utterly proportioned to each other as we now see in ways that even Thomas never could. That an XX characterizes a girl, or an XY a boy, are no more arguments for matter as primary cause than is the fact that a human sperm and egg are necessary for a human being in the first place. In any process of coming to be, artistic or natural, the matter requires previous disposition of some kind in order for the desired form to occur. So temporal priority exists in the matter. One could predict which gender would characterize the offspring if one were able to know in advance which of the millions of sperm would fertilize the egg. Still, the actuality and character of the being itself originates more from the substantial form. The second objection to gender as stemming primarily from the soul is the familiar one that Thomas addresses in his commentary on Aristotle. The objection states that a difference in form constitutes a difference in species. And since men and women obviously share the same species, their difference must derive fundamentally from matter. Even the fact that gender is primarily an attribute of the individual calls to mind matter as principle of individuation and of features proper to the individual as such. So the Thomas W. Norris Clark, seeing the importance of the soul-body proportion, yet wishing to avoid species-making difference, argues that while gender ontologically begins at the level of matter, it comes to characterize the soul through the soul's relation to its particular body. As mentioned above, 
In several passages, Thomas refers to the way in which particular matter contributes to distinction among souls. Yet in these passages, Thomas accounts for the continued numerical distinction of souls after death, for distinct degrees of intellectual ability among human beings, and for the presence of certain traits in a child's soul that resemble similar, similar traits in a parent's soul. In other words, Thomas employs the notion of the soul's commensuration to particular matter, either to account for the sheer fact of numerical distinction among souls, or to explain variations among humans involving accidental differences, differences of degree within the workings of some power of the soul. For example, one's particularly bodily disposition can affect the operation of one's sensory and intellectual powers. It can certainly affect one's native temperament, as well as other accidental characteristics. Gender, though, concerns a wholly different kind of distinction between humans, since, again, it involves its own powers, organs, activities, and purposes. The evidence does not suggest that on Thomas's principles, the particular body to which a soul is commensurated can account for the presence of such realities. For matter does not form itself into particular organs, the soul does so in and through matter, for the sake of the particular powers that work through those organs. The position I have argued affirms the notion that particular souls are, are essentially commensurated to particular bodies, but claims that within this commensuration, gender begins at the level of the soul and is rece received into the corresponding matter, accordingly designated by the genetic pattern. The question thus remains, how does such an account avoid considering man and woman distinct species? A proper response to this objection depends on correctly seeing the kind of power that gender is and the nature of that power's function. Thomas indirectly compares the powers of the soul to units of a number. If one is present or absent, a different kind or species exists. Such powers contribute to the constitution of a distinct kind, like having wings as opposed to having four legs or having feathers as opposed to having scales. The presence of a sixth sense, for example, would presumably indicate a distinct species of human. But gender is not like a sixth sense in two ways. First, gender posits no further power in virtue of which the animal's essence is determined. Rather, gender concerns precisely the maintenance of the essence that the other powers constitute. Thomas notes that the generative powers are the only ones that intrinsically concern the good of the whole species. As oriented toward the species itself, they cannot in themselves constitute new species. Second, gender concerns a co-generative power, which as such lacks the independence proper to the other powers of the soul. The other powers exclude their contraries in fact and in definition. Thus, having wings excludes having four legs. Being feathered excludes being scaled. But gender's nature presupposes one like itself, and thus depends on its contrary in fact and in definition. By way of the cogenerative relation, male is defined in terms of female, and vice versa. The male and female powers are distinct not simply in the way that the five senses are many sense powers, but as mutually dependent contributors to one action, generation. It is as though male and female constitute, at the reproductive level, the integral parts of the human essence. Thus, instead of holding that gender as stemming from substantial form would constitute a new essence, one could maintain that the human essence itself includes and demands the gender distinction as present at the level of individual form and matter, and originarily at the level of form, which makes the matter to be a particular thing. The third objection to the position that gender stems from the soul primarily might take issue with my description of the cogenerative powers. This objection might claim that there is really only one reproductive power in human nature, and that this power can be manifested in two ways, depending on the body to which the soul is united. Consequently, being male or female stems rather from matter than from form or soul. And by the way, Aquinas holds something very much like this view. If there's one reproductive power, it's actualized more perfectly in the case of a man, less perfectly in the case of a woman. By way of response, there is some truth to the objector's way of putting things. The human reproductive power is manifested in two ways. Because the cogenerative powers share the same ultimate object, namely reproduction of another human, they can be grouped under one type of power, analogous to the way in which the five senses can be grouped under one type of power. 
Yet because the cogenerative powers do not share the same proximate object as their organs and activities manifest, they remain distinct powers as co-contributors to human generation. Indeed, we find distinct cogenerative powers even within one gender, notably in woman, who possesses powers of generation, support, and nourishment of offspring. If, as this objection states, the soul derivatively assumes one or another cogenerative power because of the matter primarily, then does the soul in its own right originate a reproductive power at all? If it does not, then it could not be the soul of a human animal, for Thomas clearly maintains that all powers of the human being ultimately flow from the essence of the soul as principle of life. If the soul does in its own right originate a reproductive power, then according to the objection, this power would have to be a generic reproductive power, either abstracting from both male and female or including both. The former alternative, an abstract reproductive power, is incoherent in Thomas's metaphysics since powers are only intelligible in light of the acts through which the powers reach their fulfillment, and no act corresponds to an abstract reproductive power. The latter alternative, namely a power that includes both male and female, would mean that upon the soul's union with the body, an entire set of the soul's powers would be denied the possibility of fulfillment in principle. Each human would naturally possess built-in frustrations on the metaphysical level, which opposes Thomas's thought and the majority <coughs> of human experience. Being male or female, therefore, follows principally from one's soul in relation to that soul's correspondingly disposed matter. Section four, three ramifications. So the first ramification concerns gender's status in relation to the person. Unlike all other features included in human nature, a particular sort of correlation exists between gender and the existing person. We can think of the human essence absolutely, an abstraction from any given human being, as comprising soul, body, reason, free will, sensation, growth, and reproduction. Yet, reproduction never exists just as such, but always by way of a split into the either-or displayed by the cogenerative powers. The human essence considered in itself includes male and female, only a consideration of that essence as actually existent entails male or female. So let's return to the second classification of accidents for a minute, the metaphysical classification. If gender can be located with sensation in the category of accidents that stem from form but share in matter, within this category a real difference exists between accidents that flow from the nature itself, like sensation, and an accident like gender that flows from the nature as it exists in this or that individual. And in this sense, one's gender is not as close to one's fundamental humanity as are the other powers of the soul. Being man or woman, you might say, is more proper to the human individual than to the human individual. As Thomas might put it, being gendered at all is proper to human nature but being a man or a woman is proper to this instance of human nature, this soul, and this matter. And in fact, the notion that gender stems primarily from the soul carries special significance in the case of the human being, whose spiritual souls are individually and directly created by God. All of one's accidents other than gender that stem primarily from the soul characterize the entire species. These are the proper accidents or properties like sensation and risibility. But gender also differs metaphysically from other individual accidents inasmuch as it characterizes one's structure, activity, and purposes. Features like eye color or skin color are more easily called accidents of the person, whereas one's gender involves the intrinsic structure of the person through the soul's powers. Thus, a sui generis, inseparable accident has come to light as something that, metaphysically speaking, might be better called the primary attribute of the existing person. And I don't mean this in the sense of primarily constituting what it means to be a person, but as what first and intrinsically follows from the presupposed being of a human person, which includes rationality, sensation, bodiliness, and individuality. While gender stems from the soul in relation to individual matter, it is ultimately something proper to the whole existing person in a way that no other particular feature is. Not surprisingly, in coming to know another as a person, and not simply as useful to some end, the first thing one generally seeks to know, at least implicitly, is whether the person is a man or a woman. The second ramification 
concerns gender status in relation to the human essence or nature, the shared human nature. And for the sake of time, I'm just going to give a few suggestions on this point. Man and woman do not constitute distinct species of human nature, but neither are they simply individual instances of human nature, the way each of us in this room are. So here are some notions that can help describe the genders with regard to their shared human nature. If we were to go on thinking about this question, I think these are some terms that would be important. Man and woman as such are principles of the nature. They are parts of it. They are ways of its existing, or even ways of a soul incarnating in a body. And amidst all of these, they are relational. They're mutually fulfilling complements. Thomas compares male and female to odd and even in the numerical realm. It's a very helpful analogy, though even it doesn't get at the essentially relational dimension of gendered humanity. <clears throat> the third ramification concerns gender in its specifically human meaning as the intersection of eros and generation. Let us recall with a slight modification the Aristotelian definitions of male and female. The male is what co-generates in another, the female is what co-generates in itself. By themselves, these definitions don't necessarily reveal anything distinctively human. Gender exists in humans insofar as we are animals, though it also exists most meaningfully in human animals insofar as human procreative activity is integrally marked by rational choice. By nature, the generative act is a human act and not just the act of a human. Thus, what is distinctively human in gender comes to light most manifestly in the co-dimension of the co-generative relationship to the extent that deliberation, choice, and love are integral moments within human sexual activity, which thus transcends merely instinctual limitations. The reason it's generally considered problematic if the sexual act fails to occur within the context of mutual consent is that such a scenario presents a co-generative act without the co-aspect as distinctively human. Since the entire act is co-generative, if one aspect lacks a distinctively human structure, so does the whole. The generative end may be reached, but in a manner that has violated the very kind of being that is generated. In a way, the distinctively human dimension is less apparent on the generative side of sexuality, since biological processes play out regardless of human intentionalities. Still, the presupposition of mutual love in the co-dimension places the generative dimension in a higher context than that of mere species continuation. The generative activity itself, that is, parallels the status of the human being as desirable not just on account of the species, but also for its own sake. Just as gender in humans transcends its origin from the physical to the spiritual realm, so its activity and purpose become procreative in the truest sense of that word. When do we ever make or produce something without love as in some way the context for our making? We make in virtue of loving something or someone else, or even ourselves. In procreation, we can see the highest form of human making as a natural dimension of love. Further, as Thomas points out, generating another like oneself in the case of a human involves continued rational and affective dimensions beyond those of the sexual sphere, since the mature human only comes to be after an extensive period of support, nourishment, training, education, and love. Now, at this point, we've reached the boundary between a consideration of gender simply from the structural or metaphysical level, which this talk is purported to be, and a consideration that reaches into the psychological, social, and ethical realms. Still, seeing man and woman as articulated above can help us think better about them in all aspects of life. The argument may provide an angle from which to address some of the present problems concerning gender, reproductive technology, and the family. Metaphysically, the argument suggests that essence, substantial form, and person be approached in light of the category that gender constitutes. In closing, I wish to quickly address two phenomena visible in contemporary society which might be interpreted as refuting my argument for gender as stemming principally from the soul. The first is sex reassignment surgery. The second is the situation of intersex persons who from birth either possess partial elements of both genders or cannot be determined accurately to be male or female. Concerning the first, I grant that if sex reassignment surgery could actually change one's gender, it would be more difficult to see how gender could stem from the soul. The fact is that while 
sex reassignment surgery can, with partial degrees of success, replace certain organs, it leaves the patient sterile. A defining actuality of the power at issue has been eliminated, such that one's gender is not so much changed, it is to a great degree lost. Concerning the second phenomenon, the intersex condition is clearly an exception among human births. Yet because gender involves a power of the soul working in and through the physical realm, the possibility of deficiency or abnormality endures, just as it does in the powers of sensation. Aside from the assistance of medical technologies in such cases, it's crucial to recall that one's gender, though integral to the person, is neither the defining nor the most important aspect of the person. Along these lines, in an expansive look at living beings, Thomas articulates the place of gender in human life. The quote is there on the handout. Among animals, there is a vital activity nobler than generation, to which their life is principally directed. Therefore, the masculine sex is not in continual union with the feminine in perfect animals, but only at the time of coition, so that we may consider that through coition, male and female are made one. But man is further ordered to a nobler vital activity, which is to understand. Therefore, there had to be a greater reason for the distinction of these two forces in man, so that the female should be produced separately from the male, and yet they might be fleshly joined as one for the work of generation. The ultimate telos of the human being, involving the flourishing of a life suffused with knowledge and love, reminds us that relationality and fruitfulness occur in realms higher than the physical. If, with Aristophanes in the Symposium, one were tempted to picture the human being simply as a longing half, the passage just quoted offers a larger view. In his own way, Thomas calls to mind Socrates and Diotima's ascent to the beautiful. Thank you.